right, I am gonna welcome Somi back up here and Tanya. Love this outfit. Hi. This whole summit. Right. <laughs> I've been running around today. And... Amazing. Okay, so for the better part of a day, most of you have been here and we've been going through really the whole life cycle of women's health, right? So it's physical health, it's sexual health, it's reproductive health, it's financial health, it's kind of everything. And I love, there was a comment earlier in the day around why do we keep separating it? Why do we keep segregating it into it's one? It's not, but it's a huge conversation. And so today was a little bit of baby steps around these different conversations and how we weave them together. Part of this conversation is about how we're gonna weave them together, but also to learn a little bit more about these trailblazing women and what they're doing in women's, in the space of women's healthcare. So, um, Somi, you, many of you have met, but I would love Somi, just to, before we know about her MD, but what really, and outside of your mom's journey, as you're now in this, you were, you're a practitioner, what really drove you to starting the company? Because it's two very different things. It was all of you. It was listening to the stories. It was being frustrated because I was so educated and I felt helpless. I felt useless. I was away from my family and not making a difference. And so here I was listening to stories of women who were struggling with their sexuality, post-cancer, with menopause, and I couldn't do anything. I couldn't do anything in five minutes. They weren't getting the treatments that they needed. And so I took the time to open a place where I could partner with them, educate them, advocate for them, and empower them. And the system is broken for providers as well. How do you heal when you're broken yourself? I was seeing 50 patients a day. And I'm getting choked up because I'm about to share a very personal story. I was hospitalized in preterm labor with an IV in place um, very early, 30 weeks, and I was on call. My partners refused to take call for me. They said, well, you're at the hospital anyways. This is the first time I'm publicly telling this story. I asked the nurses for help. They removed my IV. They wrapped it. They helped me change out of my hospital gown. I went across the way with a smile on my face, delivered a baby the whole time I'm contracting and compromising my own child's health. Finally, an angel, <laughs> the charge nurse, taps me on my shoulder. Dr. Javed, are you not a patient in X room? I look up at my patient, we lock eyes, she starts crying. She's like, Javed, are you in labor? And I said, I'm not in labor, but I am a patient. She was horrified because here was the happiest day of her life and I'm there broken, but I felt like it was very early in my career that I didn't have a choice. And so that charge nurse got a hold of my senior partner who happens to be male. And uh, let's just say he got a talking to. And I was no longer on call, I surrendered my pager. But that is our healthcare system. So I wanted to create a safe place, not only for patients, but for providers, give them mission-driven work where they don't take call and they have time to take care of their patients. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing and being vulnerable. I think, again, we've, we've said it many times today, and we say this often at Luminary, storytelling is what moves the needle. Storytelling is what drives change. Storytelling is what drives people to start companies and do more. Uh, so thank you for sharing. Tanya Lewis-Lee, uh, I would love for you, for those of you that are Luminary members or in the community, I always say, 
can you tell us a little bit about your story? Because it's really important for us as women and for women of color to share their own story versus me reading your bio. So we'd love you to share your story. Sure. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Tanya Lewis Lee. Oh, she wants me to say, how much time do we have? Um, <laughs> You know, I, I will say this, uh, I think as a, as a young girl, I, I moved around a bit. My father was an executive for a corporation, so we moved around a bit. And when I was in the middle of my third grade year, uh, we left the warm waters of Montclair, New Jersey and moved to the very cold place of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And it was, it was, a, it was an environmental uh, experiential change, and it was also cultural. Uh, I was in a place in Montclair where it was very diverse. Uh, I had a black teacher who saw me and understood who I was and was really supportive of me. And then I moved to Milwaukee. I was the second black student in this elementary school. Um, they didn't want me there. They made it very clear. I was called the N-word every day for a while uh, until I, at the end of that school year, I went to another school. I bring this up because um, you know, these are the things that kind of fuel who you become. You know, you don't want to go through a terrible experience ever in life, but it's those experiences that make you who you are. Uh, and so flash forward, when I was probably in sixth grade or so, um, I remember seeing the documentary film Eyes on the Prize, where I learned about amazing civil rights leaders who were fighting to change the laws and, and make things more equitable for all of us. And I think when I look back now, I meld those things together because I would go on to go to law school. I worked for Human Rights Watch. I thought I would be a civil rights lawyer, but then I became a corporate lawyer. Um, and then I went on to a creative life because I always kind of wanted to do creative things but didn't believe I could. Uh, when I got married, I, I married a very uh, creative, artistic person who was very supportive of me doing that. And so I transitioned from a career of law to one of writing. Uh, for the first few years, I would get up in the morning uh, and I wrote by myself, just for myself, you know, a couple hours a day. Uh, ultimately, that writing turned into children's books. So I wrote, uh, I've written some, three children's books now, Please Baby Please, Please Puppy Please, Giant Steps to Change the World. Um, also around this time, my children were young and I was noticing how they were seeing themselves in the world. They are, they are brown children. My daughter is fair like me, maybe even a little fairer than me. And she was watching Rugrats and she's like, they're gray. I'm gray. And I was like, hmm, maybe we need to see more images of brown children like you. I remember the day my son was like, some people get darker in the sun. I was like, yeah, they tan. He's like, well, I'm tan. And I was like, yeah, well, you're brown. And I'll never forget seeing this little brown boy touch his face. I'm brown. I'm brown. Really trying to understand what that meant in a, in a world where he was often one of a few. Um, and so I wanted to write stories and create television and film that reflected who we were as a family and the families that I know. Uh, and uh, I went on, to, I've gone on to produce films, um, narrative films, uh, episodic television, and uh, most recently I um, stepped out from being a producer into the director's chair and co-directed a documentary film called Aftershock about the U.S. maternal mortality crisis. Um, and I'll just quickly say, that work, after I made my children's books, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services asked me to be a spokesperson for an infant mortality awareness raising campaign here in the United States. And I had the chance to travel the country and meet women of all walks of life and talk about infant health, well, a woman's health, because when you're talking about infant's health, you're talking about a woman's health, and discovered we're not doing well in this country. Uh, and anecdotally, I would hear from women uh, about stories of women who are passing away from childbirth complications. 2018, Linda Villarosa wrote an amazing article uh, about the U.S. maternal mortality crisis, and I decided I, I wanted to make a film because storytelling is how we change hearts and minds. I wanted to humanize the, the statistics about why black women were dying at higher rates
rates than white women. It's not because there's a problem with black women. It's because we have a systemic issue. And I argue the healthcare system is not broken. It works exactly the way it was meant to work, unfortunately. Uh, and so um, I think we need to have the information so we know what's happening out there. And then we have to figure out how to fix the problem. And no one is coming. <laughs> No one is coming. The problem is only going to get fixed if we decide to fix it. And we all have a role to play in it. Mine is the storytelling, and then I'm going to go on and do some other things. But that's how I get here in this seat. I love this. No one is coming. No <laughs> one is coming. So we better do it ourselves, right? Um, and then this, at the same time, you're doing all of this amazing work starting as a lawyer, then you become a filmmaker, director, producer, you also decided you're just going to start in a company as well. well that's true, too. I want, I want women to have tools. I mean, I don't want to just tell you there's an issue. And, and I heard the other panel, we're talking about, you know, our health and how do we access our, our best health? How do we work out? How do we eat well? How do we get the nutrition? And so, you know, I started a company called Movita Organics. Uh, and I'm a terrible spokesperson for the company. It's a vitamin supplement company. I'm the first person to tell you no one pill is going to do it. It has to be a part of an overall lifestyle. We have amazing products so that if you, if you want a best-in-class vitamin supplement, you can come to us. But it's also a way for me to continue the conversation with women about how do we access our best uh, uh, health? How do we get to our optimal health? It is hard. It is not an easy thing. And we need community. We need content, and we need products to do it. So you started this company now um, over 10 years ago. Uh, not quite 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah almost. Okay. Not quite. Almost, though. So <laughs> when sup... Uh, can I use the word? I'll use yes. supplement yeah, company, supplement. right? So brown woman yeah. starting... 10 years ago, before this amazing yeah, I, renaissance of, of amazing. sort of women's health care, how hard was it to start it? And did you start it by bootstrapping? Yeah, yeah, we did. I mean, I have an amazing partner. In, uh, so uh, my partner, or one of my partners in the company is a guy who was the CEO of a vitamin company. So uh, we, because of that, we have access to, again, the best in class in terms of um, ingredients and sourcing things. I would not have gotten in this business had I not had his support and access to what he had access to. That being the case, in terms of financing, uh, we have bootstrapped friends and family. We are just out there now looking for funding to because we've gotten the company this far. It's time to grow and scale it. And it is tough. The It is choppy waters out there. We know the numbers. And, and by the way, I don't know that I really want VC money either. I want to be really smart about who invests in our company uh, so we're not getting too far over our skis. Um, I want to be really careful uh, about the content kinds of people that we do work with. But it's, uh, it's, you know, the thing about being an entrepreneur, some days it is really wonderful. Some days you feel so good. It's like, I am so badass. I'm making this thing happen. Other days it's like, my God, why? Why am I doing this? How do I get out? Uh, I was I was gonna say days. I, so that's hours for me. <laughs> so true. Some hours I feel good, and some hours I feel like like holy shit, I gotta go back to being a banker, uh, because it is this emotional roller coaster, and it's hard. It's hard, and no one tells you that. No, but it's. I think I. You know, I keep saying to myself, I think it's the game. Is, is if you keep staying in it, and you keep innovating, and you keep meeting people, uh, you finally do kind of begin to meet like-minded people, uh, and and you work together to build. And I think that's been for me lately the most exciting thing. Uh, I'm I'm meeting some incredible people who are mission driven like I am because I am mission driven, but I also do want to make money. I think I don't think there's anything wrong with doing good in the world and making money. Uh, and, and so, you know, finding people who are like-minded in that way has been a true joy. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to stick it out for the long haul. We recorded that because I say this all the time. There is nothing wrong with saying you want to make a lot of money. No entrepreneur says, I'm going to go start a company to go into debt. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> and if they do, they should not be an entrepreneur. Exactly. But And whether it's if you're building a for-profit entity 
a B Corp, even a nonprofit, you have to still make money to invest in that company and that cause. And I think as women, I think it's, it's critical. We have to show that not only can we build something, but that there is a return on that investment in a big way. So let's, I'm going to flip that to Somi, because if you talked earlier today about $30 million raised, which is, again, a, just an incredible feat, especially when you look, and I hate the statistics, but I'll just say it here because I think it's really important, you know, 2%, we're sort of up and down a little too, a little over two, under two, that women accessing venture capital, and I talk about venture, right, that's venture, for women of color, it's like 0.06%. And they're trying to take that away too, exactly. by the way. Yeah, yeah with, it's definitely less than a half percent. It's, it's, in, it's incredibly low. So how do you keep going, Somi, every single day in one, putting your practitioner hat on and your provider hat, but then also as a founder, knowing all of what we have to solve, no one is coming. I'm totally using this all the time. <laughs> But then also knowing all the impact that you are having in these cities where you've already got a clinic. Every day that I want to quit, there's a story. There's a email. There's a message from a provider or from a patient. I got stopped in a bathroom somewhere public at, in New Jersey, and they were like, you're her MD. Oh my god, your staff, they changed my life. And so it's the mission. Yes. I want to make money but and pay off my med school debt one day. But I, I want to make a difference. I want there to be a legacy. And maybe that's the dreamer in me. But I want to know that I changed the healthcare system. And I changed it forever. Um, and like you said, no one's coming. And I want to be the change that we so desperately need. Amazing, absolutely. And, you, and we can do both, right? You can make money and create wealth and generational wealth and invest in your community at the same time making a difference. I didn't leave a career in finance after almost 20 years because I wanted to go into debt. I did it because I wanted to continue to make money but also have and make a difference and an impact in every single member of the Luminary community. But when someone walks in your office and uh, drives for two days to come see you, and you ask them why they're here, and they said, I need you to save my marriage. That's a huge undertaking, and you don't take it lightly. It's responsibility. It, you feel it, a responsibility. You feel a responsibility because it's been so bad for so long. So I want to switch gears a little bit because we talked in the last panel, obviously, sports and movement and, and sort of how the, the mind and the body. So wellness. Tanya, as we wellness is also such a huge topic, right? It's like marketing. Uh, I never know what's in marketing. So wellness, let's talk about wellness a little bit. What does wellness mean to you? One as a human, as a mom, but also as a founder. Yeah, I, I you know you kind of defined it earlier. I think it's all of it. It's 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 physical. It's mental. It's spiritual. It's financial. Um, it's, it's all of it. And to me, personally, wellness for me is when I have a balance of being able to move really well, feed myself well, get good sleep. <laughs> I'm a little tired today. I've been running. Uh, but, but typically, I like to get my really good sleep, really good food, movement, you know, have my, do my little, my affirmations, uh, feel connected to my ancestors and the spirit that moves around me, um, be, be steeped in a sense of purpose, uh, being, moving through life, really feeling that I am moving with my purpose, uh, and, um, you know, just being able to take care of myself and everyone around me. Um, in terms of being, a, as a founder, you know, it's interesting because if you you need to when you're working with us and and my partners and there's the, we have a sense of kindness with each other. Uh, we've been working together a long time, and 
you know, there isn't a lot of friction. There's a lot of respect. We want to hear what the other one has to say. We may not always agree, but, but the disagreement is not in a personal vendetta, take you down kind of way. And we've had people come into the business that we've hired whose energy has been kind of aggressive. Mm -hmm. They don't last long because that's not who we are. We're, we're working towards something positive and good, so you've got to bring positive and good energy to the table. And, 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 and I want everyone who's working with us to feel good. If you're, if you're, and if you need to take the time, take the time and get yourself right, um, and then and then come back to the table. And again, working in with that sense of purpose, like we are on a mission. It's a sense of purpose, um, and and I think that's when we all feel good. When I'm sleeping, when I'm dreaming, when I'm able to care for myself and my family and those I love, when I'm in, truly inspired. Uh, by the people I'm with rather than drained, uh, that's when I know I'm, I'm healthy, when I'm not feeling anxious and exhausted all the time. And so it is trying to, although someone told me being an entrepreneur is being in a constant state of imbalance. <laughs> so if you're looking for balance, you're in the wrong business. That's the advice I got um, because we are so driven. Um, but when, and when I'm spending quality time with those I love. Um, but I think as women, we forget to take care for ourselves. Oh, I am the worst. Mm -hmm. And I'm very honest about it. This isn't because I'm a founder. I, I was like this for my whole life. I, it, it is really hard for me to prioritize. And I've had my own health journey the last couple of years. And what has helped me the most, to be very blatantly honest, is my team. Mm -hmm. I have built an incredible team at Luminary. and knowing that on the days that I'm not at my best or I'm having a really hard time, I can hand it off. Uh, I had to take off a month in January. I didn't really take off, let's be honest. And I want to be <laughs> honest about that too. But I, I had to... I had a hysterectomy. I didn't know it was six to eight weeks recovery. And so I knew, though, for the month of January, I needed to be basically in a bed or near a bed. And so my team, as they do every day, just showed up. And I didn't get on one video for the entire month of January. I told clients, I'm so sorry, but I'm in short-term medical leave, that's what I used. Every client was like, oh my gosh. I had, we had clients sending flowers. And so I think because I was vocal about it and transparent, it sort of normalized. It wasn't like, well, she's not answering her email or she's not doing this. And so much of that for me, as I'm gonna run as fast as I can forever, that's just who I am. But I know that when I need to take a break, I have this incredible team and that, for me, is I can't sleep at all, ever. But I can like lay down and go, okay, they got this, and it's okay. I love that you, I love that, because it's, it's community. I mean, we need community. We can't live on an island by ourselves. And we need to have people around us that also offer the support that you can rely on. It's beautiful that you have that. And this community, for any of you Luminary members, you give me so much life every single day. I mean, there's only, there's one reason I'm still doing this after five years. It's because of the community, right? Because it is hard and it is a lot every single day. We said this morning, so me, when we were when we sort of doing opening remarks about this is whether it's a menopause renaissance, whether it's, there's so much now out there around women's health care. I love, again, no one's coming. How do we keep the momentum going? How do we continue to make this the center of the conversations, not just in this room, because by the way, it can't be an echo chamber, make it the forefront of conversations in our companies, for those of you that work for companies, um, in hospitals, how do we continue to push that? We continue to storytell. And it's from all walks of life. Just like there's not a one pill or a one hormone, it's hospitals, it's payers, providers, patients, companies, it's all of us. 
We have to remove the stigma, the taboo, and the shame. And you led by example, by saying, I'm on medical leave, and it's okay. We get sick, we need breaks. We need to normalize that conversation. Events like this. I was in DC, I was in uh, the stock exchange. Investors are talking about it. It's gonna take all of our collective voices together. It's gonna take all of our money. It's gonna take all of us advocating for this to truly kind of erase or change what we've kind of left for women historically. I talked about it this morning. It was just 30 years ago that we were included in clinical trials. That's white women. Let's talk about the lack of data on minority women. It's even worse. So we have to do a lot of damage repair. And how do we keep telling stories? I mean, you mentioned your, your son and your daughter, right? I don't know how old they are now. They're grown now, 29 and 26. <laughs> okay, so how did, but that conversation that you had all those years ago, how did that impact them to also want to create change? Because again, you're telling them, they're now telling stories. Yeah, they are actually. They're both, uh, my daughter's an artist. Uh, she's a photographer. My, my son's more of a business guy, but it's telling stories in his way. Um, you know, I think, you know, I think the thing is, is our children will keep moving things forward, um, from their perspective. I, you know, I think it's important to talk to young people in a real way, uh, uh, so that, and, and, and continue the conversation as they're growing up. Um, you know, you want to have age appropriate conversations, but you know, you also want to be real with them about what the world is like. And again, for my kids, and I wrote my children's books uh, with beautiful brown babies, not just for my children, but for all children. White children need to see black children just living a regular day in the life. It's critical. Uh, and, and we have to be able to have difficult conversations and not run away. You know, if, uh, if someone says, oh, why is Johnny's skin brown and mine's white? You have to be real about that conversation, even at a young age, and not be afraid that you're going to somehow make them racist by, by suggesting, yes, there are differences. There are differences, but we're, we're also very similar in our humanity. Um, and I think if you do that sort of just baked in in your life, your children then take that on uh, and will continue the storytelling. Um, but storytelling is everything, as you said. I mean, we, we, we all keep saying that. I mean, storytelling, again, is how you change hearts and minds. It's how we understand what our universal truths are uh, and, and how we all can, and can work together. Storytelling can be at the dinner table. My husband's a medical oncologist and he laughs. He's like, the word vagina is thrown around because I have two teenage daughters and a 23-year-old son. I mean, obviously age appropriate, but they have no problem telling their dad when I'm traveling, we're menstruating, we need to go to CVS and go buy, you know, pads and tampons. And it's it's just normalizing the conversation and, and not making them feel ashamed. Um, and they're able to talk to, you know, people about what's going on with their body. And that's what I want to do. And I'm seeing it in exam rooms. There's a different, uh, definite difference between the younger population and you know the generations of before. They're less afraid. They are definitely coming in savvier. They're reading. They're demanding more, but good, because they deserve it. Is it TikTok? <laughs> <laughs> It is all the stuff, but apparently I was told the other day by my teenage daughters that I was so unwoke that I was dead. And I was like. <laughs> well, we'll talk about uh, the, the, the generational change. My mom still doesn't know I got my period. <laughs> I've had a hysterectomy. Uh, I got my period when I was 10. And as an athlete, it, and as a very big tomboy, it was devastating to me. And I had no ability to communicate to my mom. I would steal her pads every month. And then I would go to the nurse's office every month. Lay, I had cramps all the time. And I would just say, Mrs. Trevor, still remember, because she was so impactful. 
I can't tell my mom. Can I just have, and she would do it. And she said, you know, you gotta tell. I still haven't told her. But, <laughs> but, I, but what's so great now about the storytelling, and it's not just this room. It is this younger generation. We talked yeah. about sexual wellness earlier and owning the story and owning the challenges that we face. And I think both of you in, in different ways are doing that. I know we're wrapping up, but I wanted to see if there were any questions in the audience. Again, we always offer that up. You just want to get to drinks? <laughs> We're in the way of cocktails. I know, I know. But if we don't storytell, I will say this. Women, on average, face a four-year delay in diagnosis of most healthcare conditions, and some up to 10 years. And minority women, they struggle much longer with um, hot flashes. They are less likely to get treated. And remember, vasomotor symptoms or hot flashes can be a sign of underlying cardiovascular disease. I nearly lost my mom when she was 45 years old. I told you guys that story this morning. So the cost of not storytelling is too great. And Jasmine, don't post that about my mom still doesn't know, so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was told to stand up, so I'm gonna stand up. This is good motion for me. Um, I just wanted to say one, thank you for, for doing this because I think it's really important that we have these conversations, but I can tell that everyone here is on the same page and aligned, but it's really, really important that we go outside of this and talk about it. And I also think it's really important that we talk to our partners, our husbands, our sons, because I'm having these conversations with my son, who's eight, and my daughter, who's five. And I think they need to understand what each of them needs. And I also tell my husband, we need to do this together. Like, I can't talk to my daughter about her period. We need to be together when we're talking about it. So I think it's um, something that we need to do more consciously is bring in our partners, our fathers, as, you know, all of it together, because it's a collective effort. That's the only way we're going to have change, I think, so. Love it, love it. Thank you for sharing that. It's amazing. Um, thanks. So, Kate, thank you for keeping to do it. Keep doing Luminary. I love to see that it's still alive. I pitched here like five years ago in your first pitch competition. It was awesome. Um, what else do you? So, oftentimes uh, we hear people wanting to talk, take action, and I love your, uh, I love your um, suggestions for that. Just for just quick FYI for anyone in this room, uh, we actually launched yesterday the first women's health pack in the world <laughs> or in the country. Um, so check us out on LinkedIn, um, but just as a way to take action and put your dollars and your influence behind that. But would love to, to get, um, Tanya, your just impression on storytelling and how can we tell the story differently about women's health in the way that it isn't just about reproductive. It's not just abortion. It's not just about reproductive, you know, your reproductive experience. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And, and I think that's great that you guys are starting a health pack. And I think it's great that there's so much going on right now in women's health care and women's health. Uh, and I think we're on a real trajectory. I don't think it's going anywhere. I don't think it's a trend. Like part of me, you know, you kind of want to say, oh, well, is this a trend? But, but what's happening is people are seeing that there are dollars uh, that will follow uh, in all aspects for, the, uh, for clinical trials, for research, for all of it. Um, in terms of storytelling and, and, and like what's the thing now, I think I, I love that question because I've been thinking a lot uh, about the life course, and I heard you say that earlier, you guys have been talking about the life course of a woman, but I like really thinking about from, let's say from, you know, when a woman starts, or a young girl starts taking care of herself a little bit, let's call that uh, puberty, around when she gets her menses, all the way through to menopause. I think it's great that we're having these conversations because people have woken up and said, oh my God, women who have menopause have money. <laughs> let's like suddenly, you know, like care about menopause so they can spend their money on getting menopause care. And by the way, I know I'm, I'm being a little, I think it's important women do need the care and they do need the help, but, but that's because people realize there's money to be made. Uh, and so I think, 
The thing is, it's a holistic journey. Women's health care is not just maternal health care. It's not just menopause care. It's not just sexual health care. It's the whole thing. And what happens from when you're young impacts what happens when you're a little older and they're on until you are what I call an experienced adult. So, so I think the storytelling has to really be comprehensive. Uh, so we're not segmenting ourselves off. Um, you know, we go through life in a journey. So let's talk about the full-on journey. Let's talk about the things that can pop up during the course of that journey, uh, and how we can um, prevent things. And then, if something does happen, what we can do to solve for the problem. And but. By the way, I think there are there are flyers about the Women's Health Pack throughout Luminary Space uh, out in the front. So if you are interested, there's a QR code. There's lots of information. So share that. We will share that in the follow-up email, too. OK, last question right over here. Hi, my name is Tiffany Scherer. Um, I think my question actually kind of ties it together really well. I think that storytelling does a good job of like making connection, and I wanted to know what you all do in your circles to encourage storytelling. And Kate, if Luminary has any initiatives around storytelling, like women's stories, journeys, et cetera. You guys want to start? I'll bring it home. Uh find like-minded um, companies, uh, like-minded investors, like-minded providers. Uh, Komel, my uh, co-founder, I call her the human Rolodex, uh, really invest in relationships and it pays it forward so much. Uh, for me, I work with a lot of other providers because if I can teach them, I know that every single patient they touch uh, will be changed uh, for the better, so they get the appropriate training. So it's really about building that community and working together to make that difference. Um, I would just say that I, I, I love the comment that you made about us not talking in echo chambers, right? I, I think we're at, a, we're at a place where we need to be able to find safe spaces for us to be able to share stories from different perspectives. It is, like, it's crazy to me that we, people are so siloed, and yes, we're emotional and passionate, but we cannot have a conversation until I can't tell my story without you being offended because my story steps on your story. And, and I think we really need to find space and learn again how to really share stories with one another, not take it personally, and learn and grow from each other. Absolutely, and to your question about Lumi, I mean, I think we do this in every single thing that we put on, right? From uh, hosting an I Am Remarkable workshop about getting comfortable with self-promotion and self-advocacy, all the way to our breakfast sessions around defining success, to our She Drives campaign around how we are redefining what success looks like to us, but individually. You know, I say this all the time. Everybody has a story. It's up to ourselves to own that story. And so it's why in the beginning of every session that I ever lead, I refuse to read someone's bio. Because I want to hear your story, Tanya. I want to hear your story, Somi. I want to hear your story, Tiffany. And the more we can give people a voice, they're not just feeling heard, they're feeling seen, they're feeling part of the conversation. It's also why I will never have a stage at Luminary. Because when you walk in the doors, virtually and physically, the le leave your egos at the door. This playing field has been completely leveled, and it's why we're open to all. It's why we have no application process, because I truly believe that's how we make a difference. We break down barriers for everyone in our community, and we don't put them up. So thank you both. Thank you for sharing your story. Where can we find you? And Movita as well. Yeah, uh, on Instagram, it's my name, Tanya, spelled with an O. Uh, Tanya Lewis Lee, uh, also on LinkedIn, and then Movita Organics, also on Instagram and LinkedIn. 
Amazing. And you'll tell us again, I'll Somi. Tell you again, Somi Javade, MD, and then also obviously her MD. Um, and I do have to give a shout out to my staff, my providers, our patients. We bootstrapped for seven years before we raised. And if it wasn't for our patients, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. Incredible. And and I will just do a very quick shout out again to the Luminary team. You do this, you ma you execute flawlessly. I, we are not here without the team. I want to thank Caro from the her MD team and Comel. Comel, please come up. Please come up because this started with a conversation that you and I had last year. And this is Somi's sister and also the human Rolodex <laughs> and the co-founder here at HerMD and talk about an amazing dynamic duo for building this company. And we wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for you too. So thank you. Now, all of what you've learned today, don't walk out and then kind of brush it under the rug. Take the lessons, take the connections that you've made, follow the companies that you've come into contact with. You will get an email from us with all, a lot of follow-up information and where to find them. But now let's have some cocktails, healthy cocktails. Uh, <laughs> get our bodies moving after sitting for a long day. And I just want to thank everyone for being here, participating. Everyone online, thank you for being online. Uh, and then all of you, this is why we're here every day. This is why we do this. So um, have a wonderful rest of the evening and happy Mental Health Awareness Month. And let's treat ourselves better. Let's treat ourselves better. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>